Welcome to the C-section episode. In this episode, we'll discuss why C-sections are both a life-saving medical intervention and sometimes a cause of unnecessary harm. We'll go over why C-sections are indicated, how to reduce C-section rates, and some different types of C-sections. I hope you'll join me and learn a lot. C-sections or cesarean sections are a mode of birth where an operation is used to incise the skin, abdominal tissue, and the uterus to deliver the fetus through an opening in the uterus instead of through the birth canal, vagina, and pelvis. Before a sterile operating room environment or in places in the world where currently there isn't access to medical care, a sterile operating room environment, and an obstetrician, birth can end in catastrophic outcomes for both mother and fetus. These things include hemorrhage, overwhelming infection, labor dystocia resulting in obstruction, infection, obstetrical fistulas, and of course both fetal death, stillbirth, and maternal illness and death or permanent injury. So C-sections are really important life-saving operations and without access to them, birth is certainly riskier for both the pregnant person and the fetus. So the existence of C-section saves maternal and fetal lives. And for that reason, C-sections are great. Okay, so saving lives is awesome. So why do C-sections sometimes get a bad rap? Even I just said in the intro that C-sections can cause unnecessary harm. So what's the deal? So this is how I like to explain it. C-sections can save lives and they're a wonderful thing when they're indicated. But if they're not indicated or done for the right reasons, then they're actually riskier than vaginal delivery and they shouldn't be done. Why would a C-section be done if it wasn't needed? Just because the doctor wanted to? No. Some of this is complex and we're gonna go deep into it in just a second. First, let's go over the risks and benefits of a C-section. The benefits are, like I said above, C-sections can save maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality when indicated, but there are some elevated risks compared to a vaginal delivery. C-sections have elevated risk of blood loss and hemorrhage, infection, even maternal death, and more risks of neonatal ICU admission. Having had a C-section can make a next pregnancy more risky. Having a prior C-section can increase rates of abnormal placentation, which can lead to hemorrhage and need for hysterectomy at the time of birth. It can lead to higher rates of intra-abdominal adhesions and scar tissue, which can lead to more bleeding or damage to surrounding organs in a neck C-section. So once you've had a C-section, it can make your following pregnancies and deliveries riskier. Definitely some reasons why a C-section is necessary. The three most common reasons for a C-section are fetal malpresentation, which basically means your baby is breech or transverse. It's not head down. And so it's not going to come out of the birth canal in the most optimally safe way. Non-reassuring fetal status or fetal distress, meaning your baby is showing us signs that it's not tolerating the labor process and we can't expedite vaginal delivery in the next few hours or minutes. Arrest of labor, meaning that the baby is not coming down in the birth canal either during the labor process or during the pushing process. Placenta previa, multiple gestations, twins, triplets, etc., especially when that bottom baby is not in the cephalic or head down position. If you've had a particular types of surgery where the uterine wall in its muscular portion is interrupted, either a classical C-section or a type of myomectomy, some maternal conditions like active rectovaginal fistulas in patients with Crohn's disease or serious maternal heart disease. And then of course, maternal choice. Each person can have a choice to have a C-section if that's what is important to them and they understand the risks and benefits. Okay, so you may see discussions about trying to reduce the C-section rates. An often quoted statistic is that the C-section rate in the United States hovers around 30%, whereas the World Health Organization recommends a C-section rate between 10 and 15%, which is the rate that they believe decreases maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality without unnecessarily increasing the C-section rate. So why is the C-section rate two to three times what the World Health Organization recommends here in the United States? Well, that's a really complicated question to answer. It has to do with a lot of things, but I'm gonna discuss some of the contributions to the higher C-section rate in the US and how we can decrease it. One of the first things is that we don't really have universal reporting systems for C-section rates. What we have started to focus on is the rate of C-section among term nulliparous, meaning first baby, vertex, meaning the baby is with its head down, singleton pregnancies. And the reason we focus on them is they don't have 
have the other things that may contribute to the C-section rate, like twins, like the fact that they already had a C-section before and for them, they're choosing another C-section instead of a VBAC. And it really has to do with more of the things like labor that, that we'll talk about in just a second. Certainly I make efforts in my personal practice to decrease my C-section rate. I really want most of my patients and everyone who possibly can to have a vaginal birth. All right, let's look at a few ways that we can decrease the C-section rate. One way is to decrease the C-section rate among people who have had a C-section before. So the repeat C-section rate. You may have heard of a term called VBAC. It stands for vaginal birth after cesarean. And it's where a pregnant person who has had a C-section in the past then goes on to try labor or TOLAC, trial of labor after cesarean, to have a vaginal birth. So what they do is they avoid some of the risks of a repeat C-section the second time around. And a vaginal birth has a shorter recovery and less of those risks that we talked about before. So it's a very popular option. There are some risks with VBAC as well. I will definitely do a YouTube video on VBAC. If you really can't wait for information, I have a huge highlight full of it on my Instagram. I, ask, I answer a ton of frequently asked questions and I have multiple posts about VBAC, so check that out. Another way to decrease the C-section rate is that for women who have malpresentation, meaning their baby is either in the breech or transverse position, they be offered something called an ECV, which is an external cephalic version. An external cephalic version is where doctors or midwives attempt to change the position of the baby inside the abdomen. Again, I'm gonna put up an episode about ECV, external cephalic version, but just know it can be an option for some people who want to try to get their baby into the proper head down positioning to avoid a C-section for a breach presentation. Another common reason for C-section is called non-reassuring fetal status. So this is fetal distress during labor. And there's not a tried and true way to just make a baby behave better during the labor process, but I wanted to discuss the nuanced ways this can be really difficult. In the US, we use continuous fetal heart rate monitoring to assess a baby's well-being during the labor process. External fetal monitoring has decreased the rate of stillbirth at the time of birth, as well as neonatal seizures, but we were hoping that it would also decrease things like cerebral palsy, and it doesn't. So the problem with fetal monitoring is that there is A plus perfect type of fetal monitoring called category one, and there's very, very bad fetal monitoring called category three, which would mean an emergency C-section, definitely a sign the baby is in active distress and compromise. But then there's this whole category in between called category two which is where we see patterns that are not optimal for fetal health, but they may be mild. Well, that person can probably continue laboring or they may be more severe. And we might say, this baby can't tolerate labor and needs a C-section. The problem is the tool is kind of clunky and we probably cause more C-sections based on false positives of category two tracings. So it's a really, really nuanced thing to be able to interpret and decide when is right to do a c-section it's something that i as an obstetrician struggle with all the time can this baby show us enough signs on the monitoring that it's reassuring and we continue labor or is this baby showing us that it's truly in distress and we need a c-section truly these are some of the hardest decisions to make as an ob i don't take them lightly but if we had a better tool to truly show if babies were okay or if they were in distress, then we might be able to decrease the C-section rate. The final really common reason that can be adjusted is labor arrest. So if you watched my episode on what is labor and my first few episodes, I went over the typical progress through labor. Basically, we used to think that the difference between latent labor and active labor was four centimeters, but it's been moved to six. This is the area of focus that has gotten the most attention among OBs in this country and our societies is trying to say, we need to have more patients, let labor go on longer, and changing our kind of yardsticks for what normal is and what abnormal is and when a C-section could be indicated based on how long labor or pushing is taking. So doctors are always revising that. I'm gonna link a resource below from the Consortium on Safe Labor about preventing the primary cesarean section that goes over the recommendations for 
patients and waiting during the labor process. I do think we've seen a real, an improvement in the C-section rate since this documentation and since this awareness has been around, which has been about the last 10 years or so. So this is one I'm really focused on. Don't do a C-section too soon because it's taking long. But that was a lot and it was some stuff that's kind of hard to explain. It's the stuff I trained for many years to learn. But let's go over some more education and facts about C-sections. The first thing to note is the type of C-sections. So almost always a C-section skin incision is gonna be a very low horizontal sideways incision. But what doctors we like to talk about in terms of types of C-sections is actually the type of incision that's on the uterus. So most of the time the incision on the uterus is a low transverse incision. This is a safe type of incision that's done for most women who have babies at term. It's very simple to put back together. After having one or two low transverse incisions, a patient may labor and have a VBAC. But sometimes we have to do another type of incision called a classical incision or a high incision. These are reserved for extreme scar tissue, sometimes very premature delivery C-sections. This type of incision is in the thicker muscular wall of the uterus and it's not safe to labor afterwards. So that's the difference between a low transverse or normal C-section and a classical C-section. Finally, I always get a lot of questions about emergency C-sections. So let's just go over the timing and decision for a C-section. Some C-sections are scheduled. Maybe a mom who's choosing to have a C-section or a repeat C-section, or she knows the baby is breech, the external cephalic version didn't work, she's scheduling her C-section. She knows she's going in on Wednesday at 8 a.m. That is a scheduled C-section. Then there are unplanned C-sections. Someone who was anticipating or we were anticipating a vaginal birth for them, but they end up having a C-section. And unplanned C-sections, can happen during the labor process and they can come up in a unplanned but not emergency setting or a unplanned and emergency setting. And within unplanned non-emergency and unplanned emergency, there's kind of a gray zone. So an example of an unplanned but non-emergency C-section would be like we talked about that labor is taking too long. The baby looks healthy, we can get ready to go back for the C-section, but nobody's running, nobody's frantic. Everyone's just saying, okay, we're doing a C-section now, this is the situation. Take that and consider the opposite. Sometimes the baby's heart rate, we're watching it and it goes down very low. And we try multiple maneuvers to try to get the heart rate back up but they're not working and the heart rate continues to be low for multiple minutes. We know that baby is in distress. That is an emergency C-section. Usually five to six people come in the room, multiple nurses, a few doctors. We all get everything ready really fast. We unplug all the things in the room. We head back to the operating room. We plug things back in. We get you over to the OR table and we start your C-section pretty immediately. Emergency C-sections are usually about 15 minutes or less from the time that we say we need a C-section until the baby is born. They're really, really fast. And then between there, there's like, what we sometimes call urgent. Some hospitals have like levels, um, like level one, level two, level three. The one in the middle of the gray zone would be a situation where the baby's not tolerating the labor process, but it's not tolerating it over hours. And we can decide that, look, this, we're not able to get your baby to tolerate labor, but at the same time, it's not showing signs that it's in an emergent distress right now. So we're going to do a C-section. We'll get back, we're not gonna dilly-dally, we're gonna get back there, but it's not a mad rush. So that's kind of the difference. There's not hard and fast rules. If you're confused about whether your C-section was like unplanned and urgent or whether it was an emergency, well, there may not be a big difference between those things, but you can always talk to your doctor and see how they would classify it. Again, there's some gray zone. So that's sort of the context. A quick note also, I get asked a lot about gentle C-sections and I'm gonna be honest, <laughs> I would never use more like brute force or energy than would be required on your body or your baby for a C-section. Um, but I think what a gentle C-section is really referring to is a patient-centered C-section. So we're seeing a lot more patient and parent centering in the C-sections, which I think is fantastic. The actual surgery is not any different. It's not more gentle, but what it is is a, many times there's like a clear drape and so we can bring down the blue drape and show the baby over the clear drape after delayed cord clamping and a quick pediatric evaluation, the mother's encouraged to do skin to skin. So it's just like these policies around better bonding between baby and parents and it doesn't really refer to the actual method of the c-section because i would never use and other doctors wouldn't use more force or uh, 
brute energy than they need to in a c-section so there's not like a gentle c-section and a rough c-section so anyways i hope that answers a ton of questions obviously c-sections are a huge topic and we could discuss so much more about them so in the future i will cover more things you can help me and other viewers and subscribers out by subscribing liking um, hitting the bell to be alerted about my episodes and then of course comment below about your com your questions about c-section if it's something easy to answer i'll just type in an answer or response to you in the comments but if it's a big major question then it gives me ideas for what to talk about next time be sure to check out my instagram again i have tons of information about vbac there and i will link that below in the show notes but this has been really fun i hope i cleared up some of the confusion around both c-sections both being life-saving and trying to avoid them and why and thank you for coming. I'll see you next Friday.